Forget frequently asked questions. Common sense, common knowledge, or Google. How about advice from a real genius? 95% of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed. 5% go above and beyond. They become very good at what they do, but only 0.1% a real Jesus. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius Podcast. I have Dr. Miles Spar. He's the Chief Medical Officer of Vault Health and the founder of the Integrative Medicine Program at Sims Man uh, and Wellness Center at Venice Family Clinic. We're going to talk about male hormones. Um, so, Miles, thanks for coming. How are you doing? Thanks. Great. Really good to be here. Thanks for having me. Oh, good. Uh, just first question right off the bat, when we talk about male hormones, does anyone talk about anything besides testosterone, or, uh, or is it only that? No, I mean, it's more than that. Testosterone is the main one, for sure, and that's the most important one that we should talk about. But... You know, there are other hormones, obviously, that are important in men's health. There's DHEA is probably one of the biggest ones, which is somewhat like testosterone in that it's androgenic, meaning it contributes to a lot of the things we think about as man's hormones, building muscle and libido. Um, but it comes from the adrenal gland, not the testicle. So it's a whole different kettle of fish. And then estradiol. You know, as men, we have estrogen, especially in the form of estradiol, not as much as women, but we do need some for heart health, for bone health, but we don't want too much or we'll get man boobs. So those are the three main ones. Yeah. I mean, progesterone's in there, some other things, but I'd say those are the three that are the most crucial. Okay. Well, well stepping back, um, tell me about your, your journey and your career. How did you end up um, being concerned about working with men's hormones? Sure. You know, I think part of it is I started out, uh, let's go back, actually, if you don't mind, going back to like age 13. Um, And I'm in uh, the hospital at Texas Medic Heart Institute, um, where my dad was having his second bypass surgery. Um, He was one of the first to have a redo. And I am in the elevator with him, my mother, and my sister as we're heading down to take him to surgery. Again, his second open coronary artery bypass grab, open heart surgery. We were all very scared. He was sure he wasn't going to make it. And so we're wheeling him down. And as the nurse takes him out of the elevator on the gurney, he pulls off his oxygen mask and he cranes his neck and turns to me and he says, Miles, take care of your mother and your sister. You're the man now. And that really, yeah. And it stuck with me and it really set in motion what a lot of us guys feel that we have to be this stoic, strong, never show vulnerability, take care of things, take care of other people, kind of, you know, some people call it the man box. Um, And that's how I got through medical school. That's how I got through residency. I wasn't really healthy, but that wasn't what was important. What was important was to never ask for help, which isn't great as a doctor. You'd like your doctors to be working together, but no, that's what not being, you know, being a man is about doing it all yourself. Um, So there's that background. And then going into medicine, I, I'm not going to go into the whole story, but I went into integrative medicine. So I'm an internist. I'm a board certified internist. I was very disillusioned by internal medicine and how acute care oriented it was, as opposed to really prevention and wellness and helping people make better decisions and achieve their goals. So I worked abroad with Doctors Without Borders and came back and really wanted to work in this more prevention oriented realm. And I found all of my colleagues were seeing women. Men weren't coming to doctors to seek preventive, you know, before anything's wrong type of care. And I realized it it was the same issue that I had had growing up as this stereotypical male. Um, And as integrative medicine practitioners, we were doing nothing to help with that. We weren't really making it about goals and helping guys achieve goals. We were making it these abstract notions of wellness and come seek help for that. And guys were like, no, effing way, you know, (laughs) I'm not coming in for that. So that's kind of the long answer to why I got into this. I said, you know, we have to fix this. Men are dying younger than women, and it's not biologically preordained. They're winning at nine of the top 10 causes of death, um, most of which are preventable, and it's because they're not seeking care until it's too late. So I really set out as my mission to engage men in how do you come feeling comfortable to find out how you can use health as the strongest tool in your toolkit to achieve your goals not coming from a place of weakness, of help me, I have a problem, but of strength and 
seeking like a coach, not seeking help, but seeking assistance from a professional on how you can really use health to your advantage. So what's the, uh, is there a common circumstance of the, uh, the men that you'll help, you know, age, um, are they just burned out? You know, like what, what's, um, a comment about them? Yeah, good question. I think, you know, there are a couple, I think one is there are guys who are very proactive, right. And who really want to be doing everything they can do. And they want to stay on cutting edge treatments and diagnostics and find out what a, what they're at risk for from their DNA and they want to check their telomeres and they want to be taking NAD and all these fancy supplements. And they are the ones that are easy because they're going to come to me, right? And they're going to come find out, okay, what's, what's really true about what we're reading about kind of anti-aging or healthy aging and what isn't. But the ones I really try and reach are the ones that aren't reading up on all that. And yet they have kind of a, a rift. They have something where they suddenly look in the mirror at 45 and they say, you know, I thought I'd look better at 45. <laughs> or they have chest pain or their buddy gets prostate cancer or their partner says, you know, our relationship is really in a crisis. We haven't had sex for three weeks and what's going on here? Um, some rift that makes them say, all right, I need to, I need to get some help. So, okay. Um, what's the assessment like when someone says, hey, you know, I'm not feeling like I should, I don't, uh, you know, I, I feel a lot older than I look, et cetera. What, what's your process about? Yeah, well, so it starts with, in, at, at Vault Health, and in my opinion, as an integrative medicine doc, it starts with what's important to that guy. So I think you're not going to get anybody to make any changes, whether it's taking hormones or changing their diet, unless they really feel committed to it. And the way to get them committed to it is to start with not just what's wrong, but so what, what do you want your health for? What is important to you that health could help you achieve or what's important to you that ill health is getting in the way of or suboptimal health is getting in the way of? And so really starting with that, is it about being better on the sports field? Is it about sex and having more libido or being better in bed? Or is it about being more clear headed and focused mentally? So we kind of break it down into sex, body and brain as the three categories of performance guys are really looking at improving in. And then we can decide, okay, based on those goals, what tests do we need to identify why you're not performing at your best in that realm? So, horm you know, that's why we're talking about hormones and testosterone because testosterone crosses all those. If your testosterone is off, that's going to affect you sexually, physically, and cognitively. But it could also be looking at your diet, looking at your cholesterol and inflammation markers. It could be looking at vitamin levels. It can be looking at a lot of different things that again, are very directly correlated with what you want to achieve. And then we have an idea of where you stand now, what your risks are to not being as optimized as you need to be to perform best in that realm. And then we can give you a personalized plan that's based on your goals and your specific findings in that workup to say, you know what? Yeah, your T is kind of low. Let's talk about that. T being testosterone. Or your testosterone is fine, but your blood sugar is kind of high. So let's look at how that's affecting your body composition, if that's your issue, or your thinking or inflammation or your risk for heart disease. So again, it's, it's really starting with their goals and then using that to determine what's the personalized approach to both diagnostics and therapy recommendations. So um, we start to talk about testosterone first. Um, what's, what's in the ranges? What are the levels? And what's considered to be low or very low? Sure. Well, you know, first of all, I mean, the numbers are important and I'll mention those, but it's really about symptoms and the patient, right, in that particular person. So typically, numbers under about 350 nanograms per deciliter are considered low. And the guidelines on when to consider treating with testosterone, what's called testosterone replacement therapy, guidelines come from the American Urologic Association and the Endocrine Society. And they say right around 300 or 350 is, is the lower cutoff. And what drives me crazy is some people ask, well, what about for age? Doesn't it change with age? And no, it doesn't. Normal is normal and low is low. So, you know, it's, it's like saying what's normal vision for a 30-year-old versus normal vision for a 70-year-old. Well, the average 70-year-old has worse vision, but that doesn't mean it's normal to have poor vision at 70, you know. So, yeah, the average 70-year-old has lower T, but he could still benefit from having T that's above that lower cutoff. But oftentimes we'll consider treatment a little bit higher than that, partly because some guys – if they have classic symptoms like low libido, low sex drive, or low energy, or losing muscle mass, moodiness, some of these symptoms of, of low testosterone, we'll consider treating him even if his T is a little bit above that lower limit of normal because for him, it may still be low for his body and for what his body craves. 
And the other really important thing for any listeners to know is it's not just the total number that's important. It's what's called the bioavailable testosterone that's important. So when you look at hormones, many of them have the majority of the compounds bound up to proteins, proteins like albumin and with testosterone bound up to sex hormone binding globulin. And that bound up hormone is not active. It can't really bind to receptors and do its job. What's important is the amount that isn't bound up, which is only like five or 6% of your total. So your total might be kind of okay, but if you for some reason have high amounts of these binding proteins, then you're going to have a very low amount that's free and available to really do its job. So you want to make sure if you're getting your testosterone checked, that they're checking not just your total, but your free or bioavailable testosterone. And that's the amount, again, that's unbound, that's free and ready to bind to receptors and do its job. And that level for guys, free testosterone really should be, you know, well above eight or nine, I would say. Um, which again, is much lower than that total number, but that's what's really important. So some guys are total might be okay, but if they're free is low, again, we would consider treating them. So why, why do men have um, maybe a lot of testosterone bound up by the binding hormone or why do they have low T or low free T? Yeah, well, so, okay, lots of different things. So why some have more bound binding protein mostly has to do, we think, and it's not 100% known, but it has to do with adiposity and liver issues. So we know there's an obesity epidemic. We know there are more and more guys that are overweight, and that contributes to low T in a bunch of different ways. And when I say low T, by the way, that's low testosterone. Um, So we all convert testosterone to estrogen via an enzyme called aromatase. And fat tissue, which is adipose tissue, isn't just this inert blob. It's very active tissue. And most of the activity is around converting testosterone to estrogen. It has a lot of this aromatase enzyme. So the more fat tissue, the more adipose tissue a guy has, the more he's going to convert testosterone to estrogen and his testosterone is going to be lower and his estrogen is going to be higher. And then you get this vicious cycle because the higher your estrogen is, the easier it is to put on body fat and the harder it is to lose it. That's why women sometimes have a harder time losing weight than men. So you get then more body fat, which makes more testosterone get converted to estrogen and you get in this vicious cycle. Plus the adipose tissue is inflammatory. It increases all these inflammatory cytokines, chemicals that we know increase inflammation. And that affects the brain signaling to the gonads to produce testosterone. So the more fat tissue you have, the more you have estrogen and less testosterone plus the less testosterone you make. So you breaking that cycle is really important. And then the more fat you have that gunks up the liver and the liver is what affects that binding protein. So if the liver isn't functioning that well, more binding protein stays around, less of it gets detoxified and taken out of the system. So you have yet another mechanism that the available T goes down. So I'd say the biggest culprit is fat. The other is the liver, which is affected by fat. And then the other issue is environmental, I would, environmental chemical exposures, which could be plastics. It could be breathing in chemicals, but a lot of the plastics have BPA or phthalates. Those also act like estrogen sometimes in the body. They're called xenoestrogens, X-E-N-O estrogens. And those also right. affect how the body metabolizes testosterone and how, how well the detoxification process works. So I would say to boil it all down, it's about fat and environmental exposures are the main reasons we're seeing that. And we see it not just with T, we see sperm counts dropping. We see fertility dropping for men. Um, and, and, I'm, and, and we, the scientific community, are guessing that it has to do with everything I just said, but it's not really known exactly why so substantially those rates are coming down. But there's definitely kind of an epidemic of low T and low sperm counts. Have uh, men's sperm been studied that have low sperm count to see morphologically if they're different or there's other different characteristics about them? Yeah, good question. You know, it's, you know so that when, when you're assessing fertility, just like you're getting at, you don't just look at the count, right? You look at the morphology, the shape, you look at the velocity, meaning are they moving and are they moving in the right direction? Um, there are a lot, you know, there are about eight or nine different characteristics and it's really the count that seems to be the thing that's being impacted the most, not so much as other factors. You would think with chemical exposures, it would affect some of those other factors more, but it really seems to be the count that's taking the hit the most. But mo- but there are many more studies looking at count than looking. It's a lot more expensive to do the full sperm analysis. So it may be with time, these you know, results of the counts dropping are spurring more research into into these other characteristics of sperm. So we might find out that there are other other factors that are being impacted as well. 
But for now, it seems like it's the counts that are taking the hit, so to speak. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. Okay, so um, so you're saying being overweight, uh, having issues with your liver, maybe fatty liver, et cetera, it impacts testosterone levels. Um, with the, well, actually, this brings to mind a memory about 10 years ago. Uh, I hadn't been working out for a while, and I started working out pretty heavily. And then you know, my uh, libido went up a lot. Maybe it was because yeah. uh, you know the reduction in fat and the, the normalization of testosterone levels made me feel a lot better. I don't know, but do you do you ever deal with people that go into an exercise program and does that seem to uh, affect their libido due to the weight loss? Absolutely. Like yeah, absolutely. Especially if it includes obviously you want the cardio, but includes some resistance training because the more muscle mass you have, then the more you're going to build testosterone because muscle is uh, where a lot of testosterone is um, both impacting by building muscle, but also helps boost testosterone levels. The more muscle mass you have, the more testosterone you make. Um, so certainly some of the things to start with, if somebody's kind of low in their T is, is looking at exercise and weight loss and um, cleaning things up in that way. But if they're taking medications like opioids, pain medicine, that lowers T. Um, but certainly the, the response you had could cause both an increase in T as well as increased libido, probably just from, feeling more confident. You know, I think that there, there's a lot to libido that we don't know yet, but we're sensing that, for example, stress, which if you're not feeling good, you have more kind of a feeling of stress. Stress directly impacts libido. Stress is like anti-T. It directly tells the body and brain, let's not focus on reproduction. Let's focus on survival. It's like this fight or flight mode. So just like women who are stressed, stop having normal periods. Guys who are stressed, stop having much of a libido because their body's saying, don't get laid, just focus on survival, focus on blood to the heart and the, the eyes to dilate and muscles to respond and testosterone goes down. Uh, so I think working out and exercising helps relieve stress and helps indirectly in those ways as well. The other thing I would add too that's really important is there's this bi-directional relationship between low testosterone and high blood sugar or some, what, what we call metabolic syndrome, which is a combination of high cholesterol and high blood sugar and blood pressure. Um, and we always knew that guys with low T have high blood sugar, but we also found that guys with high blood sugar actually have low T. It seems to be that they work both affecting the other. And there was a fascinating study that just came out about a month ago that showed in guys with diabetes who were maintained on a therapy, the ones that just stayed on this therapy, their blood sugar kind of crept up over time. Um, ones who were started on testosterone, and they all had low T. So some were not treated for T, they just stayed on their diabetes treatment, their T crept up. The ones who had their te low testosterone treated actually had improvement in their blood sugar. And that confirms other studies that show actually treating low testosterone can be very impactful on preventing diabetes, on reversing prediabetes, on decreasing the amount of medication needed for diabetes. So. That's another big factor is this interplay with blood sugar, metabolic syndrome issues, and testosterone, which makes sense because they're all hormones. And so insulin's a hormone, testosterone's a hormone, they all affect each other. Huh. And I guess some people have called insulin a, a master hormone, so maybe it makes sense that it would suppress T and other, other things. Yes, exactly. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's important to get it all checked out. If, if somebody really wants a thorough checkup, you need to check your thyroid. And not just the TSH, but a real full thyroid evaluation, the testosterone, the estradiol, the insulin or, you know, fasting blood sugar. And then the other hormone we mentioned earlier, DHEA. Um, and DHEA is an androgenic hormone. It's dihydroepiandosterone. It's in the same kind of pathways of hormone that starts out as cholesterol, goes to progesterone, and then gets converted to these hormones. But it, DHA comes from the adrenal gland. So that comes back to what I was saying about stress and how stress impacts libido, because not only does it lower testosterone, but if you're making a lot of cortisol, which comes from your adrenal gland because you're stressed and cortisol is the stress hormone, then you make less DHEA because the adrenal gland is busy making cortisol. And DHEA plummets, and that's another reason libido goes down. So again, the way exercise or other stress management techniques uh, can impact libido is by helping decrease cortisol through meditation or breath work or prayer or keeping a journal. And then as cortisol comes down because the brain senses there's not as much stress and fight or flight kind of feeling, 
then more DHEA is made. And DHEA is really important for, especially some guys more than others, for that feeling of sex drive and libido. So um, when a patient starts on a uh, regimen of T supplementation, is it by injection, by pellet, um, you know, by pill? What, what are some of the ways and what are some of the pros and cons of those ways? Sure, yeah. So there are multiple ways. You know, we think most typically of the guy injecting testosterone, and that's the most common and to some degree the most um, surefire. And typically it's a once a week injection. A lot of doctors do intramuscular injection and a lot of guys do that. Um, we at Vault Health do a subcutaneous injection because that's been shown to be as good. And in fact, you can get away with once a week dosing instead of sometimes needing twice a week with intramuscular. So once a week of an injection just under the skin, usually overlying the abdomen of testosterone um, really helps boost levels. But if a guy doesn't want to do injections, there are other options. There is topical. So somebody can use a testosterone cream or gel. You can get a cream from a compounded pharmacy. All this is obviously with a prescription from a doctor. Um, or there are pharmaceutical uh, companies that make testosterone gel. And those are applied topically. And for, for many guys, it'll work. So I'd say maybe 60, 70% of guys will get a nice level with the topical. The issue is it can transfer onto others. So for a guy who lives with children or a woman in the household, they have to be really careful to wash their hands thoroughly and cover the area they've applied it to for at least a couple of hours until it's absorbed well. But it can be really nice if somebody doesn't want injections. It is a daily application. So it's one that we don't use a ton of because a lot of guys, being guys, <laughs> don't want to be having to deal with something every day and put on goop every yeah. day, but it is an option um, for sure. And then there's a new pill, you know, for years, there wasn't a pill that did any good. There was one years ago and it caused liver disease and it was a mess. There was never a really good oral formulation. Now there is one that just came out a few months ago that got FDA approval called Jatenzo. So that's being used. The only kind of issue with it is it's twice a day. So again, guys being guys, many of them will forget the second dose and then they're not going to get the levels they want. Um, and the dose is different. Uh, there are about three or four different doses, so it needs to be really adjusted. So um, it's a little more work to kind of make sure you're taking that every day, twice a day. But again, it's an option for guys. Um, and then there um, are pellets. And these are really an interesting option where a, uh, usually it's a urologist or an internist, a mental health specialist will implant these little pellets under the skin, right where your back pocket is, basically over your buttocks area. So it goes into the into the tissue under the skin and over the fat layer um, and they melt away over time. So these pellets, while it might hurt a little bit going in and needs to heal up for a few days, they stay for about three months on average. It could be two to four to five months depending on that guy and how fast he breaks it down. But those secrete testosterone at a nice even level. So that's another option for some guys. And then the last thing I'll say about it and then I'll, and I'll answer the other part of your question is for guys who are actively trying to get pregnant, you don't want to be on testosterone. And it sounds kind of counterintuitive because you would think, oh, the more testosterone, the more fertile, but it's actually the opposite. If you take testosterone exogenously, meaning you're giving yourself testosterone, that actually kind of shuts down the body's own production of testosterone. And it also can decrease the body's production of sperm because some of the same pathways are involved when you're stopping testosterone coming from the pituitary gland. It kind of tells the gonads, chill out, you don't need to do much work. We got testosterone coming in and that chill out affects sperm production. So okay. there's an option or, yeah. So there's an oral option called clomiphene, which is off label. It's not approved for men, but we use it a lot in men because it can tell the pituitary gland, tell the testicles to make more testosterone and it won't impact sperm. So for guys whose T is low and are actively trying to get pregnant, that's an option uh, is to take that pill clomiphene. What about uh, HCG, you know, pregnal along with testosterone? Right. Why would that be used? Right. So that's similar. I didn't mention it because it's getting hard to get. Um, but HCG, it's like clomiphene in that it works similarly. It works through the pituitary gland, and it, it basically tells – it works like the trigger is called LH. Um, that is the trigger from the pituitary gland to the testicles to make more testosterone. So it works really well. And it actually works better than clomiphene for guys who are older, who are even over like 35. Um, the downside is it's injectable. It's a subcutaneous injection that you would do usually every other day. Um, and the issue is it's very hard to get. So you can get pregnant for sure. 
um, but it's very, very expensive. It used to be that you could get compounded HCG that wasn't crazy expensive, um, and that would work really well, but now the FDA has made it harder to produce the non-pregnal form, the non-branded form of HCG. So it is a great option. I don't like to talk about it as much because it's hard, getting harder and harder to get. But for guys who can get it, who can get a prescription, if they can get insurance to cover it, it's great. Works really well, keeps your own body's endogenous production of testosterone up, keeps your fertility up, prevents your testicles from getting too small, which can happen sometimes with intramuscular or you know subcutaneous in, uh, injection of testosterone. Um, and it's, a, it's, it's something you could also use alongside testosterone. Um, so some guys who notice their testicles shrink with testosterone and it really affects them, they can use a little lower dose of testosterone and then boost it with some HCG to maintain their own testicles production and prevent that testicular atrophy. Oh, if their testicles shrink, can they get them back? Or once they're shrunken, they're gone? No, they'll come back. They will come back. Um, and most, the vast majority, it, you know, it can take a little while after stopping testosterone for them to come back. But a lot of guys on T, they do notice a small decrease in size. Um, most of the time, it's, it's imperceptibly different. But for those guys where they notice a difference, which is a small percentage, then adding in something like, like HCG can help. Yeah, I don't know. For some reason, I wouldn't want them to shrink. And I, I, I have a yeah. feeling like a lot of guys would feel the same way. And, you know, probably to a woman or someone else, they'd be like, what do you care? But I don't know. For some reason, I bet you that... Uh, I'm just guessing based on my feeling that a lot of men would feel the same way. Yeah, for sure. But like I said, most guys, they don't notice it at all. It's, it's either they don't shrink or they don't shrink to any amount that they can tell. Um, so, you know, for that small percentage of guys, yes, it does bother them. And that's where adding an HCG can be helpful. So with the, um, what, what's the most popular way that, um, you know, your patients will use T? Will they inject mostly and then, you know, um, in terms of injections, are there any complications? Yeah, injections are the most popular because it's only once a week. It's just a small subcutaneous injection, so it's a tiny needle. You don't have to do something every day, let alone twice a day. And it's really, really reliable in terms of raising the testosterone level. So it makes a nice even level, and it works in, in pretty much every guy in raising that level. You know, and most of them, I mean, in terms of the side effects, so for the injection itself, once in a while, you can get a bruise from the injection site. It can cause an irritation, but that's pretty rare. Anytime anybody has an allergy to anything that the, test, the kind of oil the testosterone is mixed in, that can cause a problem. So you can use a different kind of oil. Um, but testosterone itself, the main side effects are um, that it can, if, if the dose is used too much, and we make sure not to do that, but if somebody's using too much, they can get acne, they can get a little moodier. You hear guys like with roid rage, and that's really like using bodybuilder doses like they use at the gym. So using regular doses to get to a normal level isn't going to cause that, but you do hear about that. Um, the other issues that, you know, we warn guys about is that they are going to de produce less of their own. So if they come off of it, they need to taper off of it and give their bodies time to kick back in. Um, the myths about testosterone side effects are that it can cause prostate cancer, which it doesn't. And it's absolutely proven that taking tea does not increase the risk of prostate cancer. And that's a big kind of fear among doctors and patients alike. Um, so we aggressively screen for prostate cancer because if a guy has prostate cancer, it could be made worse if they take testosterone in certain cases, but it's not going to cause it. And then the, the, the one um, important thing to discuss is cardiovascular disease or heart disease risk. So there is a black box warning on testosterone um, from the FDA that says that there, it is not known for sure if giving testosterone causes an increased risk of heart disease. I've looked at the studies as a men's health expert, and I lecture on this topic to doctors, and the studies are very clear that the couple studies done that led to that black box warning were very faulty. There were calls for retraction of one of the studies, and there are many studies showing that actually normalizing testosterone decreases cardiovascular disease risk, but there still hasn't been a prospective randomized controlled trial to say, does giving testosterone increase or decrease risk? So, I'll, you know, the majority of my colleagues feel that it either has no impact or decreases risk, but you do need to discuss that with every patient and say, look, there's a concern. It could increase risk. So we don't ever start it on someone that's had a recent heart attack or stroke. The literature seems to show that it doesn't, but it's something that you need to know. The FDA has said we need to discuss. And what's the goal range that uh, you try to treat patients to? 
usually if you're going with the total, you want it kind of toward the upper limit, upper level limit, which is around 700 to 900 nanograms per deciliter. You don't want to go much over that. That's getting in those higher doses that can cause the moodiness and the skin issues. Um, and if you're starting out in the three, 400 range and doubling it is perfect. And then what, um, what do patients report? Like how do they, you know, is it just always about libido or there are other effects that they report? No, great question. You know, a lot of it, yes, it's certainly libido gets helped, even erections get helped, and there have been some good studies backing that up. It also decreases risk for heart disease, and it can help blood sugar. But in terms of symptoms, most guys report just feeling better, more energetic, um, feeling a better mood, because we know low T causes moodiness, kind of a mild depression, um, feeling better sleep, and feeling a little bit more sharper mentally, because Hormones, by definition, are hormones because they have receptors all over the body. So while the sex symptoms predominate, over time, they notice these other impacts all over the body on different tissues in the body. And then the last thing I would say is, which is a big one, is increased ability to gain muscle mass. We'll see guys who kind of plateaued at the gym or have been doing the same workout and they're losing muscle mass, even though they haven't changed their workout as they age because their T was going down. And if you get their T normalized, they're able to build back up muscle and lose body fat more easily. And then what about um, long-term usage? Do you have patients that have been on it for years and years or what happens after a period of time? Yes. Yeah, we do. You know, it's funny because guys say, how long do I need to be on this? And I usually say, well, how long do you want to feel normal <laughs> and feel better? I mean, it's kind of like we're used to if someone has low thyroid going on thyroid medicine for years and years, or if somebody has diabetes, which is a, a hormone issue, right? It's insulin, not either either being resistant to insulin or not having enough insulin. So we give them medicine and they know they're going to be taking that indefinitely. But for some reason, when they have low T, they're anxious to get off of it as soon as they start. So, you know, I just say, you know, I really think you, if you bet after we, we test you after six weeks, we test you after three months, if the levels come up and symptoms you had are better, there's no reason to go off of it you can stay on it indefinitely. I have many patients who are on it for years and years and years, and it's very safe. In fact, like I said, when your T is low, it increases your risk for heart disease and even cognitive changes. So, you know, I wouldn't want somebody to go off of it and go back to having low T if they're having normal levels only through replacement. Do you have people that look forward to their shot or their pellets or whatever it is? Like, they're, oh, I'm going to get my boost. You know, they're happy and excited. Yes. <laughs> yes, for sure. Um, yeah, you have guys who, who time it out so that because they know they're going to be not feeling quite as good a day or two before they're due for the shot. So they'll say, you know, I'm going to do my shot like on Fridays so that I can make sure on the weekends I'm, you know, ready to go and I'm feeling good. And if I am a little less, you know, turned on Wednesday, Thursday, that's okay. I'm probably not going to have much sex then or work, go to the gym much then. But on the weekends, I won't have it. So, yeah, certainly guys do. Notice that, you know, after a while, it all evens out. If you're really doing it every week consistently, the level should stay the same during the week. So I think it might be a little more psychological. But at the beginning, until you're on it for six or seven doses, you are going to have a little bit of an increase after you use it and a decrease right before you're due for your next shot. Do you, um, you know, for, well, I get, I get testosterone. I, I went to a clinic for a long time. Now I do it at home. But uh, have you seen anyone okay. that gets lump, lumps? at the injection sites that, uh, you know, take a long time to go away? And if so, yeah, why? Yeah, you can't. That's just scar tissue, you know, that builds up. And so using a little bit different area each time so that you don't constantly inject in the same area because then you will get a little scar tissue building up there. Um, and then sometimes if you happen to hit a little blood vessel or nick the side of a blood vessel, it'll bleed a little bit under the skin and cause what's called a hematoma, like a little blood clot. Um, and then that takes weeks to dissolve. And so that's the other reason some guys get a little bit of a, a hard area that's a little bit puffy. I know it's really frustrating when that happens. The first one you can prevent by rotating sites. The second one, you know, it's just if you're giving yourself a shot 52 times a year, a couple of times you're going to nick a blood vessel and cause that little reaction there. And it always happens right before you're going to go to the beach or, <laughs> or something. And it's annoying. Okay. Um, any other nuance so if someone's getting uh, tea you know do you also look at their dhea do you also look at estradiol and what are some of the interplays you see that you know cause problems or are mysterious yeah i would say if you're getting tea you know be careful of some some of the tea clinics that just do tea all the time and don't check all those things you absolutely need to have a follow-up to check 
your blood count. That was the other side effect I didn't mention. Many guys will get an increased blood count on T, so you have to have your T, your blood count checked. Um, they have to have a PSA checked again, not because T causes prostate cancer, but because you have to be very vigilant about prostate cancer screening through a blood test called PSA. And then absolutely checking estradiol and DHEA. Estradiol, because like I said, some testosterone gets converted to estradiol. So in some guys that use testosterone, they may convert more of it to estrogen. And then if that estrogen goes too high, it's going to counter some of the benefits. And we can give medicine to block that hormone if needed. It's very easy to take it just orally a couple times a week um, called anastrozole. And so it's really important to get that estradiol check when you get your testosterone check to make sure you're not just driving an increase in estradiol because that will, again, work against you. And DHEA, you know, I, I usually check DHEA only um, at the beginning. And if it's normal, then I don't recheck it. If it's low and you're treating it, you absolutely recheck that and make sure that you're getting it up with an oral DHEA formulation. Um, and then we follow, and we also monitor, you know, uh, what's called a metabolic panel. So your blood sugar, your liver, your kidney, um, just to make sure that the testosterone treatment isn't affecting everything. It's not known to cause any problems with liver or kidney, but if something else starts causing problems with liver or kidney, that will affect how much testosterone someone needs. Yeah, does testosterone tend to modulate any other blood marker levels? Just the blood sugar. It absolutely can lower hemoglobin A1C, which is the average blood sugar over time, the marker for um, for diabetes. It can actually, you know, cholesterol, it's mixed. There's some studies showing it is good for bad kind of cholesterol, LDL. Other studies showing it doesn't cause a significant difference. So we're, we're not really sure how it affects cholesterol. Um, so the biggest thing is on blood sugar. It can improve blood pressure if it's normalized. Um, but those are the, the only other really blood markers that we would follow. So is this treatment... Um, is it enough for most men or there's, is there more that they need or just only certain men that have other issues? Like, what, you know, how good is it? And, you know, what, what's some additional nuance that would help someone even more in addition to T? Well, I think, you know, yeah, good question. I mean, I think certainly normalizing testosterone is important, but it's not a magic uh, bullet. You know, if somebody's diet sucks, if they're not exercising, if they're not managing stress, if they're not sleeping well, um, then it doesn't matter if you normalize their testosterone. Um, and if their thyroid's off, you know, their other hormones, their thyroid or their blood sugar is off. So, you know, I, I don't like to just say, you know, this is not a license to just not go to the gym and not watch what you eat. It should be more the icing on the cake. The foundation, the cake is diet, exercise, stress, and sleep. And those need to be dialed in. If a guy seriously cares about performing at his best, he needs to be working on those. And you can work on one thing at a time. You don't need to work on all of them. And then on top of that, get a workup to see, you know, hey, I've been trying with exercise and I'm not achieving anything. That's when you need to say, okay, I need to look into this. Are my hormones off? Are those working against me? But to start with hormones and not do any of those other things, it really is you doing a disservice and you're not going to achieve the results you're looking for. And then one thing I thought that was important that doesn't seem to be addressed is, you know, if you're in a relationship um, and you're taking tea and your partner is not, you know, man or woman, um, it seems like it could cause problems because of, you know, let's say you've been in a relationship for a long time, no one's really having any sex, and then one partner all of a sudden is now bugging the other one all the time because their libido's higher. It seems like it could right. cause strain <laughs> in the relationship. So do you do you yes. talk to men about, hey, who's your partner? We should get them tested, and if they're having a problem, you probably want to do something about it too. Yeah, we do. You know, for Evolved Health, we're a men's health company. So if they're in a gay relationship, we can check the partner. If they're in a straight relationship, then we can't, but we definitely recommend. Like you said, women do need T and DHEA for libido. They obviously need lower levels of testosterone and DHEA, but post-menopause, testosterone can go down in women too. So, yeah, I mean, I think that's, you know, really important. Usually it's interesting though. I'd say it's pretty rare. The vast majority of the time, it's the other way around, where the women are the ones that are going first to get checked out. And they may be given, if they're post-menopause, they may be given estrogen and progesterone and a little testosterone. And they're the ones whose libido comes back and, they're, and they are telling the guy, you need to go get checked because I'm feeling randy and you're not up for it. So it's funny, it's the other way around, but it definitely works both ways where, yeah, it's good to, to address the couple and to educate any guy that, yeah, you're getting treated and make sure your partner is in sync with you as well. Mm. Well, very good, Miles. Um, we're coming to the end. What, what's the best way for people to find out more if they're in your area? 
and they can see you, where's that area? And if they're not, um, how can they get help? Sure. We'll go to vaulthealth.com, V-A-U-L-T health.com. Um, and you can be seen anywhere because we're telemedicine. So we are right. available all over the country. We're not quite in 50 states yet, but we are getting there. And so if you schedule an appointment, you go in basically and you answer some questions about your goals and your symptoms. And we have things other than testosterone. We, and if you do or don't need testosterone, you may also benefit from peptides that we have for body composition. And we have um, things for libido that include peptides as well as oxytocin and other, other substances and sublingual lozenges and trochees. We have things for neurologic health. Anyway, we have a lot of treatments. So you would schedule a telehealth appointment with one of our men's health specialists who really get men, and there may not be a men's health specialist in your area. So this is a way to see one via telemedicine. And they'll talk to you about whether you need potentially testosterone, in which case we'd send a phlebotomist to do your blood work or if you're interested in some of the other treatments, and then you would have the blood work and then a follow-up visit via telemedicine from wherever you want to be um, with our men's health specialist to go over the results and see is, is testosterone what you need or not, is DHEA or something to block estrogen or some of these other treatments we have. Okay. Well, very good. And is vault as in V-A-U-L-T, like a bank vault? Yes, exactly. Vault health. Yes. Okay. Well, Miles, thanks for coming, and I'm really glad uh, we're talking about this. It's important. And, uh, I hope listeners that are you know, not feeling their best will get some help. So thank you for being here. Me too. Thank you, Richard. Appreciate you having me. Take care. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.